All right, my name is Ahmed Ricky, A-M-E-T-R-I-C-K-Y. I'm a songwriter, rapper, singer, actor, and model. Uh, yeah, that's what I do. I am from the 336. <laughs> I'm from Winston Sable. Professionally, I've been rapping for about two years now professionally, but I've been writing as long as I can remember. I started off making music when I was younger, just a way of self-expression. I grew up in an abusive household, so music was really like my only escape place. That's how I felt safe. So I used it to vent, and when I got taken and put into a group home, it was almost like, think about being in jail. You in a room, you all be in your room at 7 p.m. You can't come out till 7 the next morning. You just sitting in the room for 12 hours, no windows, no doors, just you and your thoughts. So really music was like how I kept myself sane and then when I got older, people started really liking it. So I was like, you know what, this this is my calling. This is how I reach people, this is how I express myself. So yeah, it's something I really want to do for the rest of my life because I've seen the impact it's made on people. We're gonna, we're gonna start diving into the album here. Um, and 90s Baby, 90s baby. You, you do a good job at establishing you know the direction of the album and even expanding that in some cases on certain tracks. Um, my personal favorite, Miss Monique. Um, so, and then I also noticed that you had a, um, a backdrop, a theme behind this album, um, the story of Hezekiah McCoy. Um, could you tell me what made it, you feel that it was necessary to, prevent, pre to present this story, and um, who was he to you? Hezekiah was my brother, my best friend, my partner, Crown. He, he's who made I Met Ricky, I Met Ricky, honestly. Like, He's who pushed me to be so outspoken, who pushed me to be so open, who pushed me to be so vulnerable. So when he passed, I wanted to make sure that his story never went untold, that no one could ever erase the truth of what happened to him. The male voice at the beginning and at the end is Hezekiah. The rest of the people were either people involved in his death, as in they did it, or witnesses to his death, as in, you know, the people who did it either confessed it to them, or they witnessed it, or they were outside of his dorm room door trying to get in to help him. But every recording is unscripted, it's real. It's real people telling what really happened. I learned, when I, before Hezekiah died, I thought my biggest fear in life was dying and being alone. After he died, I learned my biggest fear is not being alone or death, it's how I would end up alone. And I had to face that when he passed away. Because for the first time, I didn't have someone I could call. I didn't have someone that, if I wanted to do something stupid, they was gonna do it right with me. I didn't have someone who could just be there, that person when you need them and every person needs that. And a lot of people are religious, oh I have God, or oh, I have my family, oh I have this, I had Hezekiah. So imagine that piece of you just gone forever. So how it, in deep is really me reflecting on my life. Like I, st I, I started off, I just want to create the happiness that money can't buy with my mother's debt. You know, my mom, my mother had a lot of a lot of finances, and that's how she got away with a lot of things that she did to me when I was younger. I talk about, um, um, and if my father died, this right here, this is your son, the only one that even then you die in moments, but we scared to come and humbly approach you. Of, how me and my father don't have a connection and even if he passed away I knew I wouldn't be accepted as the man, man that I am now. So I was able to reflect on okay what if this person was gone, what if this person was gone, what if this person was gone, what if this happened to me, how would I still feel and none of that could, could compare to the feeling of losing Hezekiah. The album cover is a double entendre. First that hat is Hezekiah's hat. So me, anybody who knows me and Hezekiah Central know we were like this. Like you couldn't see one without the other one be around the corner. And he had this habit of liking to steal my clothes. <laughs> and I would do the same for him. So that hat is the last thing that I had of his. And I wore that hat every day after he died. I just recently stopped doing it. So that hat was a symbol of him, his presence on the album. The double on charm the man looking at the woman. Those are real pictures of me and Hezekiah. We took pictures of me and Hezekiah as kids, and we just cartoonized them. So in one essence, you can look at it as Hezekiah reaching out to me on the album. Another way you can look at it is my transition. It's me looking at myself and myself reaching back because I'm beginning the process. So could you tell me where Mo Miss Monique came from? And what was the process like of creating the song? And how did you get linked up with... Uh, Jay Fasina. Jay Safina? Jay Safina, because <laughs> um, she was phenomenal. J 
Jason Fina is like a big sister, like a mentor to me. We linked up actually on BS with Love, and she was like in the studio. What most people don't realize, Hiatus was created in a matter of two days. I literally did a two day long studio session, like back to back to back to back to back. <laughs> no breaks. So Jay just happened to be there, like she was there for BS with Love. And then she just kept sitting in just to like hear it. Cause she was like, she's never seen nobody recording like that besides herself. So she was just really just there like for the support for the experience. And I just told her to get on the track. But Miss Monique was a very vulnerable song. All my music is honest. Every poem I write, every song I write is honest. And it's always about somebody and it's how I feel about them. So the person Miss Monique about is someone I really cared for. I really had genuine feelings for her. and. At the time, I had just became, began my transition from female to male, from transgender, people ain't caught on. So, you don't really hear a lot of transgender artists, period. But you really don't hear a lot of LGBT artists talking about what it's like to experience a relationship. So that's what Miss Monique's poem was about. It was very vulnerable. It was, well, if my daughter decides to love a woman, you know, what it feels like. Because I wanted people to understand that sexuality doesn't change how you love. It doesn't change how you feel at the end of the day. So a lot of people are used to seeing the I'm at Ricky with the soft voice, the I'm at Ricky with the long hair. So in a lot of ways, as I'm transitioning, people are learning how to accept me both as a person and as an artist. Because you're about to hear a new voice. You're about to hear new stories. It's a new level of vulnerability because it's a new person. As a transgender man, period, yes, there are a lot of challenges. I have to deal with being accepted by people. I have to deal with people respecting me. I have to deal with, from a business standpoint, people scared. Well, when you were on at Ricky the female, yeah, we wanted to sign you. We don't know how to market a transgender person. <laughs> regardless of how talented you are, regardless of how much you're worth, we don't know how to present you and make you accepted in an unacceptable America. So it's almost like you have to learn how to care about yourself and stick to yourself enough in a world where people don't care about you. I'm sorry that I gave in. The pills they started speaking, started screaming. I was days in. They told me about my efforts, how my world was never changing. They told me about my work and that I'll never make a playlist. They told me about my love and how she's never returning. They said this couple.